Jews were only allowed to shop during specific hours of the day, and non-Jews were not allowed to shop in Jewish-owned stores. Non-Jews were just not allowed to associate with Jewish people. And then, a big letter J for Jew was stamped on ID cards and on passports. These restrictions went on and on. And it was then that my parents decided to make arrangements to leave the country. My grandparents, who in the late 70s and ill, refused to leave their home. They could not understand the urgency or the necessity of doing so. My grandparents passed away in 1938, just 11 days within each other. And soon thereafter, we received our necessary papers for our immigration to America. November 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht, or Crystal Night. It was the night of broken glass when the Nazis and their many followers smashed the windows and the storefronts of Jewish-owned stores. Jewish establishments, synagogues, and Jewish books were burned and destroyed. This was the beginning of a massive pogrom against the Jews in Germany, a massive verbal and physical assault against all German Jews. In reality, this was the beginning of the Holocaust. And to think and that this, this, all this terror and all this evil was promoted by the government. On November 12th, following Kristallnacht, the German government actually fined the Jewish population for the damage caused that night. These imposed taxes were used to rearm Germany. The night of Kristallnacht, my father was taken away from our home, and unbeknownst to my mother, was sent to concentration camp Buchenwald in Germany. All sorts of terrible stories were related to my mother, and we did not know who would ever see my father again. He was released after 10 days, only because our papers were in order for our immigration to America. And to think that just a few years prior, he had been awarded the Iron Cross for his military service in the German army of World War I. We were forced to sell both our home and our business for a fraction of its worth. And soon thereafter, in January of 1939, we left for Holland, from where we were to sail to the United States. And for almost nine months, while awaiting our quota number from the American State Department, my parents were assigned to take care of some 125 children. These young children had been sent by their parents from various parts of Europe to escape from the Nazis. In December of that year, 1939, we were deported to the detention camp of Westerbork in Holland to await our departure day to America. Camp Westerbork was constructed by the Dutch to accommodate Jews from various parts of Europe. In May of 1940, just one month before our planned departure date, the Germans invaded Holland and we were trapped. All of our belongings, which were about to be loaded on board ship, were burned and destroyed as the harbor of Rotterdam was bombed. Under Dutch control, Camp Festival was tolerable. My mother, father, brother, and I shared two small rooms. We all ate in a communal dining room, and at that time there was enough food for us so that we did not go hungry. Adults were assigned to various work duties. My father worked to repair shoes. My mother worked in the kitchen. We children had a makeshift education and lived a very dull, stagnant life. Several months later, when the Nazi SS took over the command of Westerbor, we became acquainted with the ever-present, terrifying, 12-foot high barbed wire. And as thousands of Jews were mounted up, many taken from their hiding places, as was Anne Frank and her family, her festival became overcrowded. And it was at that time that we had to share our small quarters with another family. And then the dreadful transports to the concentration and extermination camps in Eastern Europe began. This started 
in early 1942. And from then on, every Monday night, lists of those to be deported were posted, causing incredible anxiety, anguish, and fear. And then on Tuesday morning, men, women, and little ones were marched to a nearby railroad platform from where they were transported. This area became known as Boulevard de Misere. It was an area of complete misery. At 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning, the trains left for their destination. And of the total 120,000 souls that departed Westerbork, 102,000 were doomed never to return. We were placed in a section that was known as the Stern Lager, or the Star Pen. Named so because we had to continue wearing that yellow star which had been issued to us back in Holland. Men were on one side of the can and the women on the other. And this did make it possible at times for families to get a glimpse of one another. 600 of us, 600 of our people were crammed into each of the crude, wooden, heatless barracks meant for 100 when originally built. There were triple-decker bunk beds with two people sharing each bunk. German winters were bitter cold and very long. We were given only one thin blanket per bunk and a straw-filled mattress. And this bunk was our only living quarters, and that for two people. I was very lucky that I was able to share a bunk with my mother, and that my brother was able to share a bunk with our father. But can you imagine two adults, two strangers, sharing a bunk under such horrendous conditions? A bunk that was no larger than the small cut bed that we're all so familiar with. I remember the first time seeing a wagon filled with what I thought was firewood for the one small oven that we had in our barrack. That oven, of course, was never used. I soon realized that what was in the wagon were dead, naked bodies, thrown one on top of the other. Toilets and so-called washing facilities were at a great distance in the most primitive outhouses. Toilets were long wooden benches with holes cut into them, one next to the other. There was no privacy. There was no toilet paper. There was no soap and hardly ever any water with which to wash. And in the almost year and a half that we were in Bag and Belton, never once were we able to brush our teeth. There were no trees, no flowers, nor did we ever see a blade of grass. And whenever it rained, we had to slush through the mud, adding even more misery to our very dismal existence. Every morning, Every single morning, without fail, we were ordered to line up on a huge field. It was called an appel platz, five in a row as we were counted. We would have to stand there until each and every one of us was accounted for, often from early morning till late at night, without food, without water, no matter what the weather, without protective clothing. Frostbite was common. We would treat our affected toes and fingers with the warmth of our own urine. Our diet consisted of a slice of bread a day, a pad of butter, some hot watery soup with grizzly meats and turnips and potato peels. Bread was later cut back and given to us just once a week and only if our so-called quarters were neat and in order. Our birthday present to one another was that little piece of bread that we had saved up from the previous week. Once a month, we were marched to an area to shower, and there, under the watchful eyes of the guards, we were ordered to undress. We had heard about exterminations and gas chambers in other areas of Europe, and we therefore were never sure when the faucets were turned on as to what would come out, water, or gas. 
The Nazis did their utmost to break us physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Unfortunately, they did succeed with many of our people. It was not uncommon for people who were no longer responsible for their actions to attempt escape, even though they knew that their chance to succeed was next to impossible. But they also felt that they had nothing more to lose. The failure of their attempts were obvious when we saw their lifeless bodies hanging electrocuted against the barbed wires, and men suffered most from malnutrition and were the first to die. Those who lasted the longest were the women, and mothers in particular. It was their strong will to keep their children alive that kept them going. And my mother was one of those remarkable ladies. There is no doubt in my mind that it was my mother's inner strength and fortitude that finally saw us through. One day, my mother was able to smuggle some potatoes and some salt from the kitchen where she worked. Using an empty can as a pot and pieces from the wooden slats from our bunk as firewood, my mother somehow managed to cook some soup in secret. This was done on our bunk. I was on the bunk with her, trying to hide and she was what she was doing. Soup was simmering, just about finished, when the German guards entered our barrack for surprise inspection. In our rush to hide that setup, the boiling soup spilled on my leg. We had been taught self-discipline and self-control the hard way, for I knew for sure that if I had cried out, it would have cost us our lives. This happened in the spring of 1945. I was just 10 years old. The population in Quebec and Belgium were dying off rapidly, but not really fast enough to satisfy the Nazis. Several weeks later, it was decided to send three trainloads of our people to Eastern Europe towards the extermination camps and the gas chambers. My family was among the 2,500 on the last of these three trains. It was April of 1945, the Russian army was closing in from the northeast and the British and the Americans from the west. Under normal conditions, this train ride from bergen Belgium to whatever area of Eastern Europe they wanted to send us would have taken no more than 10 hours. But because the Germans tried to evade the Allies, we were en route for two long weeks without food, without water, without medical supplies, without sanitary facilities. That meant no toilets. Whenever the train came to a stop, those who were able and those who were strong enough were permitted to get out and take a drink from a nearby stream or dig up roots to eat. My mother remembered taking some sort of a pot and collecting water from the locomotive, and who knows what else that pot was used for. The need for water at that time was almost more important than food because of the severe dehydration due to the dysentery and the high fever due to the typhus. Let me briefly explain typhus. It is a highly contagious, deadly disease that's caused from filth and spread by lice. At the same time, while the train was at a standstill, the newly dead were taken off and buried along the tracks. In addition, our train was subject to frequent air attacks by the Allies. It is truly remarkable how any one of us was able to survive under such horrendous conditions. In fact, 500 of our people, that's one out of every five, died on route or shortly thereafter. My burnt leg was severely infected and it was impossible to keep the wound clean or lice free. In late April, after 14 days of this surreal and horrifying journey, the German guards stormed frantically through the train, seeking civilian clothing so that they would not be recognized by the Allies. And we knew then that the war was coming to an end. It was the Russian army that liberated our train and led us to a nearby farm village in eastern Germany. 
Most of the inhabitants had fled and we took over their homes. Kitchens were stocked with ample food. It was rich and good, actually much too good for our starved bodies. We could not tolerate that unfamiliar nourishment. And at that time, at the age of 10 and a half, I weighed 16 kilos, or as we know it here, 35 pounds. And my mother weighed a mere 70 pounds.